Well, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, I have one last thing uh, to finish up saying about uh, carbohydrates in general. And then we're going to turn our attention to a um, very interesting phenomenon known as signaling. So um, when we get into signaling, we start beginning to see how um, controls of cell division and uh, processes like that uh, lead to ultimately uh, important health considerations for cancer and other things. The uh, one thing I want to mention uh, today uh, about carbohydrates that I didn't uh, finish up with last time also has some significant health considerations as well. And um, it actually has to do with viral receptors. And uh, the example I have for you is that of the flu virus. Uh, it's the time of the year where the flu is moving around and many people um, have not gotten vaccinated against it. And for students that want to go into health professions, I think that's pretty outrageous if you haven't gotten inoculated for the flu, against the flu. But in any event, um, that aside, flu is an important um, health consideration. And what you see on the screen is um, a, an interesting depiction about how a flu virus uh, affects a blood cell. It, it infects, not affects, infects a blood cell. So the flu virus is a virus that contains RNA, not DNA. And um, if you look inside the virus right here, you see several, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, actually in this case is fragments of RNA that uh, consists of the uh, entire coding information for the flu virus. One of the questions people commonly ask about the flu virus is, well, how come there's so many different types and so forth? And it's partly because of mixing and matching of different uh, strands of RNA that can occur uh, when you start mixing um, infections from different organisms. And so flu virus is very, very um, important, uh, as I say, health consideration and also very, very variable in terms of the different uh, forms that it can come up with. Well, a common feature of many of the forms of the flu virus is uh, what you see on the screen. They infect blood cells by attaching to a, uh, an extracellular component. You can see this extracellular component um, is um, actually here. Um, and the um, virus has on, the, on its outside coat, it has projections sticking out. And two of them are of interest uh, to us. The first one is hemagglutinin. And hemagglutinin, again, as its name uh, implies, is what's responsible for the virus agglutinating, that is, attaching itself to a blood cell, heme referring to the blood cell. So hemagglutinin is a protein that recognizes and binds to a specific carbohydrate residue on the surface of a red blood cell. So this, this protein, hemagglutinin, uh, you can see it's projecting all around this virus. It's just basically waiting to latch on to the appropriate carbohydrate residue uh, on the surface of a blood cell. Once it is latched onto that um, specific carbohydrate, then uh, the virus has to get its RNA into the blood cell. And it turns out that in order for this to happen, that there has to be an opening created um, in the blood cell for the entry of the viral RNA. And the opening creation requires action of uh, this enzyme known as neuraminidase. And what neuraminidase does is it cleaves a residue, uh, a modified carbohydrate residue known as neuraminic acid. And that cleavage is necessary. We can see it depicted over here for the entry of the viral RNA, okay? So the combination of the hemagglutinin binding to, the, binding to a specific uh, carbohydrate residue and the uh, neuraminidase cleaving a neuraminic acid containing residue on the surface of the red blood cell allows the viral RNA of the flu virus to enter the cell, infect the cell, and cause uh, many more copies of the virus uh, to be made as a result of that. Um, interestingly, uh, this uh, neuraminidase is a target of anti-flu drugs. So uh, when you hear of the anti-flu drug known as Tamiflu, it, is, uh, it works because it is a neuraminidase inhibitor. It inhibits the action of the neuraminidase. Well, if the neuraminidase can't cleave that residue, there's no, enter, there's no way for the viral RNAs to enter the, flu vi the, the uh, blood, blood cell, and the flu virus is pretty much uh, left waiting out there. 
Okay, so uh, that's one place where cellular uh, carbohydrate residues on the surface obviously play important roles in human health. Sir? Well, inoculations always boost your immune system, and they are targeted at recognizing specific uh, proteins on the surface of um, flu viruses, as they are for any virus. Yeah. Okay. And there are many other strategies for viruses as well, but Tamiflu is a very cool one. Okay. Well, that's what I want to say about carbohydrates. Um, I want to turn our attention now to talking about cellular signaling, and I think you'll find some interesting and important considerations uh, of signaling for human health. Um, signaling is um, essential for uh, multicellular life. Uh, when we have differentiated cells of an organism, it's important that those cells of the organism all pull their ores uh, in conjunction with each other, and that is um, coordinated by the action of small molecules that move through the body that um, basically communicate. Those small molecules are known as hormones, and hormones um, are basically produced in one part of the body by cells in one part of the body. They travel usually through the bloodstream and get to their target tissues uh, where they bind to specific receptors and cause inside of the cells of those target tissues a response. That response might be Let's activate a bunch of enzymes. Let's inactivate a bunch of enzymes. Let's tell the cell to divide. Let's tell the cell not to divide. All kinds of possible responses can happen as a result of the binding of hormones to the cell surface receptors. And so we're going to spend some time talking about those receptors as well as about a few of the signaling pathways that are there. I will caution you as I go into this that this lecture is the beginning of a series of this goes to this, goes to this, goes to this, goes to this, and it is important for you to understand and know what those, excuse me, what those pathways are. So if I talk about them here, yes, you will be responsible for them. Okay, well, before we get to the this goes to this, goes to this, goes to this, um, let's uh, take a look at three uh, receptors that we'll be talking about over the next day and a half or so. And uh, they refer, to, uh, the, the three receptors are the beta adrenergic receptor, that, as we will see, is very, very important in um, ultimately in controlling uh, levels of glucose in, in the body. Uh, the insulin receptor, which plays a very important role in um, also controlling levels of glucose in the body, but it works in an opposite fashion to the beta adrenergic receptor. The insulin receptor also is involved in many other processes. It's not only involved in uh, blood glucose. And a third receptor, the EGF receptor, which stands for epidermal growth factor receptor, which is uh, intimately involved in helping cells to decide, do I divide or do I not divide? Okay? And so that decision of dividing or not dividing is a very important one, as we can imagine, if the cells are continually getting signals telling them to divide and they shouldn't be dividing, we may have uncontrolled growth. And of course, the definition of uncontrolled growth is a cancer. Okay. Now, this very simple figure shows what happens in signaling in the body. I told you that uh, the uh, tissues in one part of the body communicate by uh, making a, a molecule that they release called a hormone. They release that into uh, the uh, uh, bloodstream of the body. It goes and travels uh, to the place where it encounters other cells that have a receptor specific for binding to that. So that's the reception part of the, um, uh, of the process. As we will see, the reception part of the process involves not only binding of the molecule that was released, that is the hormone, but that binding induces some very important structural changes inside of the receptor protein, the receptor protein being located in the membrane of the target cells. And the changes in uh, that structure of the receptor uh, protein uh, results in a process we call transduction. So when you hear the term signal transduction, what we're talking about is the communication of information outside the cell to mediate a response inside of the cell. Okay? So that's the, the phenomenon of transduction. Transduction in turn causes those responses to happen that I talked about earlier. 
might be activating an enzyme, it might be inactivating an enzyme, it might be activating entire classes of enzymes, proteins, quite a wide variety of things that can happen. And then it's very important that cells be able to turn that process off. Okay? Cells are not one-way um, uh, um, uh, machines, as it were. They turn something on, they need to have the ability to turn it off. Question? <coughs> So signal transduction is the phenomenon whereby a information, information outside the cell is communicated inside the cell. So a hor an example is a hormone binding to a receptor. That receptor causes, uh, has some shape changes, as we will see, that will cause several things to happen inside the cell as a result of that. So it's, but it, the transduction is just that general phenomenon, okay? Okay. So now, turning this process off is also important. I will spend more time talking about turning the processes on, but I will point out to you some places where turning them off um, is important consideration, are important considerations. Okay. <coughs> now, um, I want to introduce a term to you, uh, second messengers, before I introduce a term to you, first messengers. Uh, and that's kind of odd, uh, but I uh, need to do that. So uh, what is a second messenger? A second messenger is a molecule inside of a cell. And it's a molecule inside of a cell that is made as part of that signal transduction process. Okay, so it's made as a result of that signal transduction process. Well, now you ask the question, what's the first messenger? And the scheme that I've been depicting for you, the first messenger is the hormone. The hormone is extracellular. The first messenger is extracellular. Hormone, first messenger, I use those terms interchangeably. Okay. It never makes it, at least in the schemes we'll be talking about here, it never makes it into the cell. It binds to a protein receptor on the cell surface. That protein changes shape. That shape change causes some things to happen. And those things happen inside the cell. But the hormone does not make it into the cell. Now, second messengers in general are very small molecules. Okay. Second messengers are not proteins. Okay. Second messengers, uh, one we'll talk about a lot is cyclic AMP. Uh, next term we'll talk briefly about cyclic GMP because cyclic GMP plays a very important role in our vision. Cyclic AMP is a much more generic second messenger. It occurs in a lot of cells and is used for a lot of signaling purposes. Calcium, as we will see uh, today, or, or if I don't finish today, then certainly on uh, Wednesday, plays an important role in uh, this, this uh, signal transduction, that is the, the signaling process inside of cells. And it happens, uh, it is not something that is made, but it is something that is released from various stores that cells have inside of them. Inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate, as you're more likely to know what IP3 is a, uh, an important uh, messenger that is made um, as a result of action on a bigger molecule that also makes diacylglycerol, and I'll show you that uh, later. So the four messengers that we will be concerned with in the lectures here um, are uh, shown on the screen. Okay, well, uh, let's think about those receptors. Receptors are important because receptors, we remember, have to, have to basically um, bind to that first messenger. They have to change shape upon binding. And that change of shape has to somehow result in production of a second messenger. We will see that in most cases that production of a second messenger does not occur immediately, but instead occurs after several steps later. Okay. Now, there are different classes of receptors. The, one of the more common classes that we have on our cells are called 7TM receptors. And you can and no, you don't need to memorize this table, but you can see that 7TM receptors play some very important roles in a wide variety of processes. Neurotransmission, hormone secretion, smell, taste, vision, embryogenesis, control of blood pressure. All of these things are very, very important processes that are mediated by 7TMs. So 7TMs play very, very important roles in all of these processes. Well, why do we call them 7TMs? The reason we call them 7TM is if we schematically examine them, first of all, we remember that they are located in the membranes of target cells. 
Schematically, they look like this. They project through the lipid bilayer. This is the membrane, the outer membrane of the cell. And they cross. Here's the, here's the start. This is the end terminus. And here's the C terminus. Here's the end over here. They cross the membrane seven times. So the TM part of it doesn't stand for transcendental meditation. In fact, it stands for transmembrane. Seven transmembrane domain. That's what it's called. Yes, sir? Is the amino or carboxyl end preferentially on the inside or outside of the cell? Yes, it will generally be as, as you see it here. Mm -hmm. So this um, arrangement uh, is common among many, many different um, receptors involved in uh, these processes that I'll be describing to you. Now, this is a very simplistic way of uh, depicting the way they look. A more realistic way of how they actually appear in three dimensions is something like what you see um, on the screen. Um, there are some similarities. Here's one involved in rhodopsin. rhodopsin uh, is light sensitive, uh, for example. Here's one that uh, is an, a beta adrenergic receptor that we'll be talking about here. But we see some similarities in terms of the organization of the seven transmembrane uh, domains. You notice in the middle of these seven TMs that there is a binding site for a molecule. And that binding site for the molecule is, in fact, <coughs> excuse me, the first messenger. So the seven TM has a binding site for the first messenger uh, to um, come in and do its thing. OK. Now, the one I'll be talking about first is uh, the uh, beta adrenergic receptor, as I said earlier. And the beta adrenergic receptor uh, is um, sensitive to, that means it binds to, the hormone epinephrine. Epinephrine is shown on the screen. No, you don't need to know the structure of it. But I will tell you that epinephrine is derived from tyrosine. And epinephrine is also known as adrenaline. So epinephrine is the thing that we produce when we get scared, we get um, uh, anxious or whatever. It's produced in other conditions as well. But a big dump of epinephrine can have an enormous effect on uh, our bodies, as we shall see a little bit today, but much more uh, in the next couple of weeks. So epinephrine is a first messenger. It's a hormone produced by the, by the um, uh, adrenal glands. It is essential for the um, uh, f flight or fright response, basically. OK. Now, what happens in this response? I'm going to show you the first half of that today. And I'm going to allude to the second half of it. Uh, and then I'll show you more detail about the second half of it in about two weeks. OK. Well, let's imagine that I am <clears throat> excuse me, out um, going for a hike in the woods, and I discover that there is a grizzly bear that is on my tail. Okay? So the grizzly bear uh, starts to chase me, and I realize that I'd better get my butt moving, or I'm going to be in trouble. I get scared, and my body produces epinephrine. Epinephrine uh, goes and binds to target cells. Now, these target cells that I'll be describing to you here, we can think of as muscle and or liver cells, because these are both important for us to uh, produce glucose in the case of the liver and get away in the case of the muscle cells. Okay? So epinephrine is released into the bloodstream. It travels. It hits the receptor. And when it hits the receptor, as I've said uh, previously, what happens is the receptor goes through a slight change of shape upon binding. So this guy has bound to epinephrine. It's the little yellow ball inside of there. And that slight, slight, that slight change of shape. What did I have to drink before I came to class today, right? Some schlitz. Uh, the slight change of shape um, causes the interaction of the 7TM, that is the beta adrenergic receptor. It causes the interaction between it and a cellular protein known as a G protein to change. So this G protein is normally just sitting here right next to the 7TM. Okay? Sitting here right next to the 7TM. Binding of epinephrine changes the interaction between these two. And you can see the result of this change is that this G protein, which has three proteins in it known as alpha, beta, and gamma, changes from holding GDP 
to holding GTP. That's number one. Now, I will tell you that, first of all, that is a replacement reaction. That is, we, the, the, the receptor does not make GTP. It causes this guy to dump its GDP and pick up GTP. Now, that action causes a change in the shape of the G protein. And this whole complex is known as the G protein, by the way. Okay. It causes a change in the shape of this G protein such that when GTP is bound, the beta and the gamma subunits no longer bind to the alpha subunit. Zunet. Zunet again. OK? Now, why is that important? Well, it turns out that the beta and the gamma subunits, when they bind to the alpha, they cover up a region of the alpha that would otherwise bind to, another en to an enzyme. The enzyme is known as adenylate cyclase. So we can see this process happening. When this guy has GTP, it sheds its beta gamma subunits and now can interact with this enzyme known as adenylate cyclase. Again, the ASC telling us it's an enzyme. Adenylate cyclase, <coughs> excuse me, you can see is also a membrane protein, but it's a membrane protein that is an enzyme. When the, G, when the alpha subunit of the G protein binds to adenylate cyclase, we see that adenylate cyclase catalyzes the formation of cyclic AMP from ATP. ATP is converted into cyclic AMP. Now we've seen several steps happening in this process. Binding of the hormone, alteration of the interaction with the G protein, replacement of the GDP on the G protein with GTP, The interaction of the GTP alpha with the alpha subunit of the uh, uh, 7TM with the adenylate cyclase. And now adenylate cyclase is activated to make cyclic AMP. Well, you remember from our discussion last week that protein kinase A is allosterically activated by cyclic AMP. And that's what's depicted on the screen here. So we see this being activated. And if you recall what I said about protein kinase A, I said its name told you what it does. Kinase means puts phosphate onto protein, means it's putting phosphates onto proteins. So what the result of this entire action on the screen is, is that protein kinase A has been now been converted from an inactive form to an active form. It will start putting phosphates onto serines and threonines of target proteins. And what we will see in a couple of weeks is really interesting with that. Okay? I'm going to give you just sort of a preview of that right here. Okay? Putting phosphates onto target proteins is going to affect those proteins. And it generally has effect of either turning them way on or turning them way off. A really good example in our liver, for example, our liver has glycogen. I told you last week that glycogen was a storage carbohydrate for glucose. We store it so when we need glucose, we can make it. We can release it from glycogen. We have glycogen in our liver because we have enzymes that make it. We also have enzymes in our liver that can break it down. Now, what protein kinase does a does is it puts phosphates onto both the enzymes that make glycogen as well as the enzymes that break down glycogen. Why is that important? Well, it has opposite effects on them. Putting phosphates onto the enzymes that break down glycogen activates them. Putting phosphates onto enzymes that make glycogen inactivates them. That's kind of important. We don't want to be making glycogen as quickly as we're breaking it down at the same time. Okay? So putting, putting phosphates onto enzymes that break down glycogen activates them. And putting phosphates onto enzymes that make glycogen 
inactivates them. Now I'll talk about that, as I said, the next couple of weeks, so don't, don't panic on that. I'm just giving you a broad view here. So let's kind of think about what's happened with this hormone action. I got scared. My adrenal glands produced epinephrine. Epinephrine went out into the bloodstream. It bound to target receptors. Let's think about these for the moment in the liver. That caused a G protein to be activated. And putting a GTP in it is what activates it. That activation allows it to interact with adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase makes cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP activates protein kinase. And what is protein kinase doing in the liver? It's stimulating the breakdown of glycogen. And breakdown of glycogen gives me, ultimately, glucose. I got scared. My blood supply gets a giant infusion of glucose. When you hear the stories about people who see a baby under a, an automobile and they go out and they grab the automobile up and they pick it up because they got scared, those are real. Okay? Because of the enormous dump of glucose that's happening as a result of this hormone action. Okay? So this pathway is pretty phenomenal. And it, it happens, you look at this, wow, there's a lot of steps to this pathway. This process happens in seconds, and it actually would happen faster if the hormone itself didn't have to travel through the bloodstream. Okay? So this is a pretty phenomenal process, and it happens really rapidly. Okay. Now, this process is the one I usually start with in talking about um, signaling because it gives us a good taste of what signaling pathways are like. We like to think about, well, one thing happens and then all of a sudden the cell responds, but in fact we saw several things that had to happen here sequentially in order for the signal to be communicated. There was our second, second messenger right there. We had to go through all of this before we made this second messenger. Now, as we will see, cyclic AMP has, has many effects inside of cells. One of them is activating protein kinase. There are other effects that it has as well. Okay? It might be a good place for me to tell you a story about cyclic AMP. Okay? Cyclic AMP, when I said we turn this process on, we also like to have ways of turning this process off. Right? Well... Let me show you one of them. One of the processes that we have to turn off is shown right here. Okay. Yep. Actually, I'll leave that there. Yeah. Okay. So here's my activated G protein. Right? I've got GTP in there. I want to and I need to not leave that thing in the active state because if I leave the G protein with its GTP, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to stimulate the production of a lot of cyclic AMP. And the production of a lot of cyclic AMP is going to activate a lot of protein kinase. And that's going to activate a lot of glycogen breakdown enzymes. And bang, all of a sudden, I burn up all my glycogen. I need to control that fairly readily. And for G proteins, cells have a very interesting but a very odd way of controlling them. Okay? G proteins get their name from the fact that they you find them carrying guanine nucleotides, either a GDP, where it's inactive, which is what we see over here, or a GTP, where it's active. How does, do we get the GDP from the GTP? Well, you can see right here that there's a hydrolysis reaction that occurs. And it turns out that G proteins are really bad enzymes. I'll repeat that. G proteins are really bad enzymes. Bad in what sense? They're terribly inefficient. What do they catalyze? They catalyze the breakdown of GTP. They catalyze the breakdown of the very thing that activates them. They bind to it, and over the course of minutes, they'll say, okay, I'm going to break you down. And when they break it down, they basically turn themselves off. So G proteins are self-regulating. They turn themselves off over time. That keeps the cell from 
making too much activated enzyme for breaking down glycogen. That's very important. We don't want to be doing that. Okay? So G proteins are very inefficient enzymes. How about some other considerations? Well, what happens if I have a receptor that binds to epinephrine, but the epinephrine gets stuck? In the normal scheme of things, it just goes backwards this way, dissociates, the epinephrine's gone, the cell doesn't go on and do its thing. Okay? So it stops activating uh, G proteins, and the process stops because the G proteins, in turn, inactivate themselves. But what happens if that gets stuck in there? Well, one of the considerations if it gets stuck in there is cells have yet another way of turning off the beta-adrenergic receptor. That's by, by action of this, this enzyme known as receptor kinase. And what receptor kinase does is it puts phosphates onto that C-terminus of the G protein. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, not the G protein, the C-terminus of the 7TM. That's important because now those phosphorylated residues on the C-terminus are a target for binding by the enzyme known as arrestin. This now binds the 7TM and stops the 7TM from activating G proteins. So the cell has a way of turning off that signal if there's a problem with the receptor. Now again, the fact that this machinery is built into the cell says something very important about the need to control signaling processes. If I don't control signaling processes, just like I don't control enzymes, I'm in deep doo-doo. Okay. Well, that's good. That's all fine and dandy. Yeah? The beta arrestin is attracted to the phosphates. Mm -hmm. beta, beta arrestin binds to the phosphates on the, the beta adrenergic receptor. Well, that's fine and dandy, but there's one thing I haven't told you. Okay? I've shown you how we can knock out the, the epinephrine. I've shown you that the G protein turns itself on. What about this guy over here? Once I've made it, isn't it going to just sit there forever? Okay? If I have this cyclic AMP, isn't, isn't it just going to sit there? Even if I turn everything else off, isn't cyclic AMP going to be a problem? Well, it turns out no. Cells have an enzyme floating around inside of them, ubiquitously, known as phosphodiesterase. And what does phosphodiesterase do? Well, it breaks down cyclic AMP. That means that cyclic AMP, if we look at the cyclic AMP levels in the cell, we see that when signaling happens, they go up, but they fairly quickly come back down. And the reason that they come back down is the phosphodiesterase starts catching up and starts breaking down that cyclic AMP. So now we've seen three things here that can help to shut down this signal when cells, so they don't want to have it going all the time. Now I tell you this because it's very interesting that a critical player in this process is phosphodiesterase. Okay? Phosphodiesterase is a target for a very important drug. It's known as caffeine. Okay? Caffeine inhibits phosphodiesterase. Now, I'd like you to think about the buzz you get from drinking your coffee. The buzz is real. And by the way, the buzz occurs at a couple levels. I'm only describing one level to you. But one of the levels at which it occurs is you are inhibiting phosphodiesterase, therefore you have less breakdown of cyclic AMP. Less breakdown of cyclic AMP means more breakdown of glycogen. More break breakdown of glycogen means more blood glucose. I just got a buzz. Kind of cool. Okay? Kind of cool. Questions about that? I'll slow down. Shannon. And that's why you crash, right? That's why you crash. You will crash, yeah. And uh, the other reason that you crash is people don't just drink coffee. They drink like what I describe as chocolate milk, sir chocolate milk, syrup, cream, macchiato, uh, latte, um, espresso. Okay. They've got all this sugar crap that's in there. That not only is their body dumping sugar out there, but they've got all this stuff that they've put into their system. So the blood glucose levels go bowing. 
And as we will see, when the body sees blood glucose levels going boing, glucose is a poison, and so the body acts to take it out of the bloodstream, and there's your crash. I'll talk about that in a bit. Yes? So you make, without all the sugar and stuff you might add to your coffee, would just the caffeine be bad for diabetic then because it can throw off the... It's, it's, ca it's, ca it's a very common question. She asked if, if caffeine is bad for a diabetic. It's one of the most common questions I get, and I, and I don't know. I suspect for some people it could be a problem, but in general, diabetics have problems more with what they ingest than what their body is producing. Yes? What about synthetic sugars? Will your body recognize those in crash? Okay, so what about synthetic? You mean like, like artificial sweeteners? Yeah. yeah. Does your body crash from artificial sweeteners? The idea of the artificial sweetener is that you stimulate the, uh, the sense receptors that, that taste uh, sweet, and there's no calories that's contained in them. And for a long time, it was felt that, in fact, that there was very little response that happened to that. But there have been recent studies now that have suggested that artificial sweeteners, in fact, actually are inducing the production of insulin, which is what happens in the uh, consumption of sugar. It's not as pronounced, but there is some production that's there. Not because of the process that I'll describe to you, but probably more likely because of a learned response in your brain. Okay, so learn something about how your body works there. There's a denylate cyclase. It is not a 7TM, but you see it's bound in the membrane. Blah, blah. Um, what else do I want to say here? There's words telling you what I've showed you on a figure there. Okay. And that's what I want to say about seven about uh, the beta adrenergic receptor. I've got some time, so I want to talk now about another uh, 7TM system. I'm not going to talk um, uh, about the first messenger, and um, that's not really important for our purposes. But the, one I want to t the, the process I want to talk about here is another 7TM system. It involves a receptor. It involves a G protein. The receptor that most commonly is associated with this is, is called angiotensin, which is an, an important receptor for uh, modulating blood pressure. Okay? And so some of the things that I have to say here will have effects uh, ultimately on blood pressure. Well. Angiotensin is involved in, angiotensin is um, involved, the angiotensin receptor, I should say, is involved in um, using a different kind of second messenger. The second messenger that it uses is called PIP2. Okay? And PIP2 is basically a compound that's found in the membrane of cells. You know that cells have a lipid bilayer. That lipid bilayer tends to have molecules that are long and nonpolar stuck into the layer, and then a polar portion that is projecting out of the layer. In this case, out of means on the inner portion of the membrane. And what this signaling pathway does is it activates an enzyme known as phospholipase C. Phospholipase C acts by cleaving this guy in the membrane into two pieces. Both pieces are second messengers. So when the angiotensin receptor gets stimulated, it activates phospholipase C by action of a G protein. Phospholipase C then catalyzes the breakdown of PIP2 to DAG, D-A-G, and this long name, which you can call IP3. Okay, So that's what's up in this signaling pathway. Now, if we look at it at this level of the cell, this is what it looks like. Here's the cell membrane. You notice that we're not depicting, in this case, the angiotensin receptor uh, out there at all. But we have, in this membrane, we have some PIP2. When the angiotensin receptor activates the G protein, the G protein activates phospholipase C, and phospholipase C now cleaves PIP2 and makes two things. One is it makes DAG, which remains in the membrane, and second, it makes IP3, which is water-soluble, and IP3 leaves the membrane and travels into, in this case, a calcium storage reservoir. 
It's labeled as ER here, endoplasmic reticulum. Sometimes you see it labeled as sarcoplasmic reticulum. They're both involved in sequestering calcium ions. Okay? So what's happened? Receptor has activated a G protein. G protein activates phospholipase C. Phospholipase C makes DAG and it makes IP3. IP3 travels to a receptor, this is a second receptor now, in the endoplasmic reticulum and binds to it. When it binds to it, it causes the receptor to open up and let calcium out. That then increases the concentration of calcium in the cytoplasm. And an increased concentration of calcium in the cytoplasm goes and binds to this protein called protein kinase C. Protein kinase C requires two things to be active. It requires calcium and it requires DAG. The combination of these activate now a different protein kinase. This different protein kinase then is active in phosphorylating a variety of target proteins that mediate a cell's response. Now, I always like to point out when I talk about this that though we don't really talk much about muscular contraction in uh, this class, that you should know um, ultimately from your basic biology classes that calcium is a signal to initiate muscular contraction. Calcium is a signal to initiate much muscular contraction. Angiotensin is favoring the forming of tension by stimulating the release of calcium in these target cells. And we could imagine how this tension in target blood vessels, for example, could affect blood pressure. So calcium is described in this system as a second messenger. I describe it actually as a third messenger. And you can, just, you can call it either one as far as I'm concerned for the exam. But I think you can make a case for it being a third messenger because here it is produced as a result of action of a second messenger, IP3. IP3 is a second messenger. DAG is a second messenger. Calcium, if you call it a second or a third, really doesn't matter. But it happens only after the action of a second messenger. No, it's not a first messenger because first messengers will always be outside the cell. Okay? Okay. So that is the phospholipase C system. Now, calcium, it turns out, in the cell is a bit of a problem for cells. And the reason it's a bit of a problem for cells, you saw that, I had, that the cell had it sequestered in the endoplasmic reticulum. There's a reason it keeps most of the calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum. A, it allows it to release it and signal, so that's kind of important. But even more importantly is the fact that calcium really likes to bind to DNA. Calcium binding to DNA can actually cause your chromosomes to precipitate. So you don't want that calcium concentration to be too high. So it's let out in little batches. And one of the ways that cells keep the calcium concentration low, even when calcium is released, is by using calcium binding proteins to help communicate the signal that, hey, calcium's been released. Now, when we examine the structure of these calcium binding proteins in the cell, we discover they, ha they all have a common shape. And the common shape is that they're known as EF hands. It's depicted here. You can see the finger in yellow. You can see the sort of fist of the hand down here below. And you can see that the calcium site is right here in where these fingers are curled around. This common feature is found in many calcium binding proteins. One of the most abundant calcium binding proteins that we have inside of cells is known as calmodulin, C-A-L-M-O-D-U-L-I-N. Calmodulin binds to calcium. It has EF hands, 
The binding of calcium by calmodulin induces, not surprisingly, a big structural change in calmodulin. Here's calmodulin without calcium bound to it. Here's calmodulin with calcium bound to it. We see that the binding of calcium induces a big structural change. Okay? And that big structural change allows calmodulin to interact with, in this case, a, something called cam kinase that it couldn't interact with before. Why is that important? Well, if calcium is a signaling ion and calcium is a problem in concentration, what if I have a protein that gobbles up the calcium but still communicates the signal? That's what calmodulin is doing. It's saying, hey, calcium has been released. Do your thing. In this case, it's activating a kinase by binding to it. And that activation happens only because this protein has bound to calcium. So tricks that cell use, cells use to counter the effects of high concentrations of calcium arise because of this binding, uh, in this case, of, of uh, calcium by calmodulin. OK, let's see here. Um, I'll start, and I won't finish this. I'll start one, one last thing. Okay. The last thing I want to say very briefly about is insulin. And when I introduced the hormones originally, I said to you that insulin is um, important because it really counteracts the effects of the beta adrenergic receptor. The beta adrenergic receptor, when it's activated, stimulates an increase in blood glucose by the process I described to you. Blood glucose levels go very high. Well, glucose in our bloodstream is a poison. If there's one message I want you to take out of this class, that's it. It's a poison. In high levels, glucose is a problem. So our body has a defense against glucose being a poison. It's, it's insulin. Insulin is also a hormone. Insulin is a first messenger. And what insulin does is it stimulates target cells to take up glucose, thereby lowering the glucose concentration in the bloodstream. You're sitting there saying, but you said it was a poison. Cells are taking up a poison. If cells did nothing with it, they would have a problem. But cells do things with glucose. They may burn it. They may store it in the form of glycogen. They may do other things to it. All right? But the important thing is the blood glucose levels are falling. It's glucose in the bloodstream that is the real problem. That's how we get kidney damage. That's how, why some uh, diabetics have to have uh, limbs amputated, for example. That's why they may go blind, because they've got too much glucose in their bloodstream. Now, next time I will tell you how insulin does all of that. It's a pretty cool process. And remind you again about the poisonous nature of that compound. There you be, sir. I left you logged in. Good man. You bet. How you doing? Hanging in there. Good. No, so, so that's the ER is, is an organelle. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Right. So that's right. Okay. Because organelles have their own membranes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oops, excuse me. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs>